All right. Continuing. Okay, I'm now going to identify Cambyses as Cyrus, since the scripture does it by referring to the conquest of Egypt. And according to his historians, it was Cambyses that conquered Egypt in 525 BC. All right, the first year of Cyrus was 529 to 528 BC. And this corresponds to the first half of the 70th year of exile. This is when the decree was given. At the end of the, at the, end of the 70th year of exile is when Judah was, when they were all in their cities. Okay, so here again is our gold column right here. 68, 69, 70. Okay, if we line this up here, right under the staff there, that's the beginning, that's the beginning of the first year of Cyrus. And then right above the south, that's the end of the first year of Cyrus. Otherwise known as Cambyses. So the decree was made somewhere in the first half of the 70th year. After the decree was made, the exiles gathered together and they went and settled in Judah. And then at the end of the 70th year, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities, and the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Okay, this is mentioned in Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. Also, confirming that the exile goes along with the exile of King Jehoiakim, we have Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus saith Yahweh, that according to the fullness of Babylon, seventy years, I will visit you and perform the good word, my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. This place meaning Jerusalem. Okay, Jeremiah 29.10 is actually a letter of Jeremiah to a specific group of exiles, namely the exiles that were exiled along with King Jehoiakim, the artisans, the craftsmen, the nobility, and the great men of Jerusalem were exiled. And so this letter was specifically addressed to them. They were exiled in 597. So the Babylonian exile fits all the historical facts. From 597, back to the beginning of it here, Here's 597. From 597, King Jehoiakim was exiled, okay, to 528. 528. In order to understand this, all we have to understand is that Cyrus is a throne name, just as the lexicon says, and the scripture calls it a surname, using the Hebrew word for a title, for a surname, which was handed father to son. Okay, now, let's see here. Let's go back up to the outline. Okay, the question is, why did the church and synagogue err in miscomputing the 70-year exile? And the reason is, it's because neither recognizes the suspended year principle or the stopwatch principle which we have demonstrated using the 390 years, the 40 years, and also the 40 years in 1 Kings 6.1. Okay, they seek for all 70 years for Babylonian rule, Jeremiah 25.11, in the past. And then they guess at when they ended, but the end point makes no sense. Okay, and the way we have to understand this is that the Babylonian rule actually suspended after um, 66 years. And this is actually proved in the text of Jeremiah 25, 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith Yahweh, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolation. At no time before 75 AD, can anyone point to the land of Babylonia becoming perpetual desolations? The city of Babylon itself stood for many centuries afterward and endured some setbacks 
but it did not become perpetual desolations. Okay, so it did fade in. It did fade into history after uh, AD 75 or so, but that's only a type of the final destruction of Babylon. It's not actually the final destruction, which we hear about in the book of Revelation. Furthermore, the prophecy here says that they would, th those nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Well, the king of Babylon stopped controlling the nations after 66 years. The Chaldean king of the Babylon, Babylonians. Persian king took over Babylon, but he wasn't Chaldean. All right, so the suspended year principle is required to understand this. So the stopwatch principle allows us to infer that four years remain for the king of Babylon to rule. Okay, and if we look in the book of Daniel, we'll find that the little horn is the king of the north, which rises up in the end of days. This will be a revival of the king of Bab the Babylonian empire, and he will bring all the other six empires under his hegemony. Okay. Now let's look briefly at the 70 years from the ninth year of Zedekiah to the second year of Darius. Okay, if we back up here. There we go. This purple column, this is the reign of King Zedekiah. And this is the king that the king of Babylon put on the throne after he deported Jehoiakim. And he reigned for 11 years. Okay. Something happened in his ninth year. This is when, in his ninth year, which would be 589 or 588, spans both years. Okay, this is when the siege, Nebuchadnezzar began the siege. All right. And we know that this calculates 70 years. This is what I would call the dark, the orange column, or the dark gold column here. Calculates those 70 years. Okay, 70 years which are mentioned in the book of Zechariah. Right here, Zechariah um, 1 7, or actually 1 12. Um, talking about the cities of Judah, Jerusalem against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years. Okay, and this is synchronized with the, the second year of Darius. So if we come over here to Darius, the second year, and we know where it began by counting backwards. All right, if we go back to the fall of Jerusalem, we have another 70-year period mentioned in the book of Zechariah. 70 years of fast, okay, and, and I have the two fasts each year for 70 years. There's the destruction of the city, the burning of the city in 587, and the fast for 70 years, two fasts per year, come down in this light blue column here. And that comes to the fourth year of Darius. So here's the 70th year, and here's the 4th year of Darius, okay? Of course, there's all the kinds of information I'm skipping over, internal dates and stuff. All right, we go back up to the outline here and discuss, okay, like I said, Cyrus is a throne name, and Artaxerxes, Josephus calls Artaxerxes one who reigns a little later, he calls him Cyrus. And this is important because this is the Persian king that says the city should be rebuilt. By using a title, the scripture can have the prophecy be fulfilled by more than one Persian king. And in fact, the instructions to build the temple, to continue to build the temple, finish the temple, and build the city, and then put the temple back into operation under Ezra, were all given by different Persian kings. 
that would have this title, Cyrus. Cyrus is called Mashiach, Messiah, the Anointed One. Okay, and this is because Cyrus is actually a type of Yeshua, the Savior. Okay, the word Cyrus means shepherd, and we have the, the Good Shepherd passage in the book of John. We have the shepherd passages in Ezekiel, the one shepherd that will gather the flock. The flock will have one shepherd, Messiah. Okay. Yeshua will build Jerusalem. He talks about, I go to prepare a place for you. He's busily building the new Jerusalem. Okay. In the age to come, he will build Ezekiel's temple. So again, the prophecies concerning the shepherd, the Mashiach, he will build the city and the temple. Okay. The Cyrus or shepherd prophecy hints of Messiah ben David, we know as Yeshua. Yeshua is Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Messiah ben Joseph is the suffering servant and Messiah ben David is the conquering Messiah who sets up the kingdom. In one person, but in two separated comings. A first coming and a second coming. First coming as a suffering servant and then coming as the son of David, the conquering Messiah. Okay, we have a clue here, what I call a remez, or a hint, as to who Messiah is in Isaiah 45, 15, uh, 14. We read the first part of the text already, the labor of Egypt, and we concluded that the, f the first Cyrus to return them was Cambyses, because Cambyses is the one who conquered Egypt. So we'll skip over all of that here. Okay, the text then continues, they shall make supplication unto thee. This is the word for prayer, okay, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else, there is no God. So, this is obviously something that would be considered idolatrous if it were applied to um, the Persian king Cyrus. This passage is actually speaking of Messiah, who is the Almighty in a human form. So the passage actually applies. And then the passage dovetails into a direct statement in Isaiah 45, 15. Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And here's a key word that clues us in on the interpretation of the text. Because it's giving us a strong hint that the Messiah has been hidden in the, in the prophecy of Cyrus. Okay, and we studied the other passages on the Malach Yahweh, and that the Malach Yahweh is also called Yahweh, also called in Genesis 32, a man, and also um, he is called El, God. Jacob saw God, Panim El Panim, face to face. Okay, so again, this is Messiah. The Messiah is hidden under the, the figure of the person of Cyrus. To round this out, Jewish anti-missionaries love to mention the Cyrus passage, and they often will point out that, uh, that Cyrus is Mashiach, or Anointed One, in order to show that pagan or mere human figures can be called the Messiah. And their object in doing this is Essentially, it's a hundred percent bluff because in Cyrus is actually a very strong hint prophecy of Messiah Yeshua down the line. And the reason that this strategy is used is because it's natural for opponents of an argument to think that when an ar argument is put up, that it's the strong suit of their op opponents. And therefore, they don't really look into the details of the argument thinking that they just have to figure out how they can dismiss the argument. When in fact, if you examine the Cyrus passage, um, it's actually a strong suit for Messiah, and the Jewish anti-missionary argument against it is really 100% bluff. The prophecy is just as messianic for Yeshua as the other messianic prophecies. Uh, the Cyrus passage fits perfectly the messianic theme for Yeshua, right down to his being 
Yahweh in the flesh. Okay. Um, the, chronolo the chronological and thematic confusion of who Cyrus is and who Cyrus represents should not throw us off track. Actually, he's a type of Messiah. Cambyses, titled Cyrus, gave orders to build the temple. Also, Artaxerxes, Cyrus. Josephus explicitly calls him Cyrus. He also gave orders to build the temple. Um, or, I mean, sorry, Artaxerxes also gave orders to build the city. And Messiah, who is Cyrus, the shepherd, will give orders to build both the city and the temple. Thank you for listening.